don't know it, but even the five and ten cent store wouldn't handle this stuff until today. Really? Well, how much do you want for it? As much as I can get for it. But I'll take fifty dollars a share. Well, that's more than I expected to pay. That's more than I expected to get until I heard that you wanted it. Very well, then. Fifty dollars a share. Mr. Boughton, you know that man that was just in here? No. Who was he? I don't know. But he's just bought a hundred shares of Atlas International Copper at a hundred dollars a share. The man must be mad. And now he's dickering for a thousand more at fifty. Well, the stock is worthless. It's Hollywood has always gone. loved con men. And we do too. The smooth-talking huckster who swindles the pompous and foolish alike is a cinch for a laugh and a knowing wink. Until the joke is on us. In 2008, when the U.S. economy imploded on a pile of toxic mortgages and high-level Ponzi schemes, American anger focused on a few larger-than-life characters only Hollywood could have invented. Bernie Madoff, who built eager investors out of $18 billion during three decades of smoke and mirror financing. Alan Stanford, now serving a 110-year sentence for operating a similar scheme from his corporate offices in Texas. There were other smaller fish, but here's an uncomfortable fact. Many of those prosecuted for fraud and financial crimes since 2008 didn't cause our national financial meltdown. How do they get away with it? Even worse, are they still getting away with it? Those are the questions asked by a new book of essays edited by scholars at John Jay College. The book is called How They Got Away With It, White Collar Criminals and the Financial Meltdown. I was one of the editors of the volume, along with my colleagues, Susan Will and David Brotherton. Professor Brotherton, chair of John Jay's sociology department, is with us today to explore our collective failure to hold the architects of the meltdown accountable. He's joined by another David, David Shapiro, a veteran forensic accountant, former prosecutor, and ex-FBI agent who contributed one of the essays in the book. So, David, let's, let's start with you. Um, I guess the obvious question, first of all, is was what got us into this mess criminal or was it just sort of bad judgment, bad finances, um, and disingenuous customers? No, absolutely criminal. Um, of course, you know, the regulations are very lax, but the guys uh, knew what they were doing and they knew what they were getting away with. They knew they were going to reap uh, incredible benefits at the end of uh, a whole process of bamboozling uh, thousands, if not millions, of people through mortgages and cheap loans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They knew that uh, it would have international repercussions. In fact, you know, many of the, the leading culprits in this were international and global uh, to begin with. So they knew uh, exactly you know, what they were operating with and, uh, and who was uh, going to pay the price, which was essentially nobody at the top, but uh, many millions at the bottom. It was indeed criminal. But then again, uh, you know, there are some people who might say that, you know, we've, we've, we've shot our best attempt. We're not going to go after these guys. The time clock is running out. Um, I mean, is there more that we can do for the people who are already responsible for this? Or should we begin looking at the next steps? I mean, what, I mean uh, the, the book suggests that there was a criminogenic environment to begin with that we never really um, cope with. Um, do we still have that environment? I mean, is there something we can do to... To fix that. Yeah, very much so. Um, I think there's been some tightening of the regulations, financial regulations, and we know now that um, some of the big banks have been paying off a few billion uh, for some of the malfeasance around mortgages, and some of that will trickle down to a lot of the people who, who lost their homes and uh, are going to be forever in debt. But it's not enough. Um, you can't carry forward a society that presumes to be democratic without a democratic morality. Um, people have to be accountable to the public. They have to be accountable to the voter. And uh, these include, include both the, the big financiers and the larger uh, players in, on the scene here, as well as the politicians who uh, not only uh, defended them and allowed this to continue for year after year after year, but were in fact paid by them because mm -hmm. these, the bank has actually supported many of the politicians and both political parties, in fact, both the Democratic and the Republican Party. So, David, let me go to you. You're a, a seasoned forensic accountant. Um, you've been in the trenches and courtrooms. Um, does morality really have a place in the market? I mean, we're talking about people making lots of money, 
but it's pretty hard to go after folks just for doing things that are unethical rather than not criminal. I mean, there are people who say that we should just move on by now. Well, morality does have a, a place, an important place. Uh, all contracts have the implied presumption of good faith on the parties and so forth, honesty and fact. But, but I do hesitate from labeling everybody uh, as criminals and so forth and describing things that way. Although, because having been in the trenches, I deal with specific cases, specific individuals charged with specific things. I hesitate from drawing a, a broad brush and throwing uh, the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. Uh, there are certain uh, things that are wrong. There's asymmetry of information, and I think that goes to what David just mentioned, which is an important point which still exists. To a certain extent, not everybody knows what everybody else knows, and that is part of, of how these processes, these outcomes are gamed. And to that's, the how extent they're your, gamed that's how you make your money, basically. Exactly. Well, you wouldn't expect, if you're an investor in Goldman Sachs, you wouldn't expect people, you wouldn't expect Goldman Sachs to be telling other folks your positions. So to a certain extent, we expect it and want it when it works out for our benefit, but we're, we're less tolerant when the outcome seems to be that a couple guys get wealthy and the remainder of us have to take on two jobs. Well, I think what part of the problem is it's not just about individuals. Right? This is systemic failure. Or it's, a, it's the way the system is supposed to work. Because in the last 15 to 20 years, as Saskia Sassen pointed out you know, very adroitly in the book, there's been a financialization of society that the bankers and the big financial houses which are now global conglomerates have had uh, an enormous amount of importance uh, placed upon them and they draw on that importance in society and as they become more important the ordinary other economic actors and the workers who make up the majority of the country their input and their importance and their and their gravitas and their way the way there are different ways to affect society and affect democracy have lessened. You see this simply also in the way wealth is distributed. Wealth is distributed now much more towards the centre. It's become a, a very pyramidal kind of, kind of society. And the middle classes and the working classes are losing out. They're losing out economically and they're losing out politically. So this allows these folks at the top, not simply as individuals to rule the roost, but as a system to rule the roost. If we cast our minds back 10 or 15 years, we can say we've been here before. In, in the era of Enron, uh, there was a national push to go out to protect customers again, to try to um, uh, regulate the market in a stricter way. How do we step back from that? How do we pull back and begin looking at really serious protections for the consumer and for the ordinary homeowner? Well, I, I think the point, part of the problem is that we need to have a commission of inquiry which fully overturns all the stones that we don't normally like to overturn. Much like we had the Church Commission inquiry into the CIA and its actions abroad after Vietnam and so, and so forth. We need this kind of inquiry that really is uh, accountable to the people and doesn't mind people facing the truth. Let's go back much further than what uh, you did there. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, Reagan was deregulating the banking industry. And after one of his pronunciamentos, he turned to one of his aides and says, we're on a bonanza here, literally. Mm -hmm. Like, we've hit the jackpot, I think, is the actual words, right? Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, we had the savings and loan crisis, but Keating went to prison, and a number of other people went to prison, right? Not long after that, we have the deregulation of the energy industry, and Enron, obviously, becomes this major uh, uh, case, a uh, celebrated case, uh, in point. But they, some of them went to prison, didn't they? So why, why can't we put the top guys in prison? We're putting a lot of, there's something, been, there's something like 2,000 prosecutions over the last four years of middle-level managers. We're seeing the DOJ, Department of Justice, act seriously against some top banks in the last couple of weeks. But we haven't really gone after the key folks at the heads and the tops of these hedge funds and the big banks. I mean, is there a reason for that? Um, can we go after them? What sport prevents us? Well, I agree with what David had said. Uh, nothing historically has prevented prosecutors from going after the big fish. So one asks, why not now? And one thing that gets glided over is that, well, maybe the big fish didn't do anything criminal. A thought that maybe people don't want to have, but it's a real possibility. The, the modern corporation has so many checks and balances in it 
with diffusion of responsibility throughout, that it's tough to identify any individual, especially the higher you go in the hierarchy, as responsible for a specific action. Not to pick on Goldman Sachs, but if you take a, a, a CEO Blankfein, any decision that he approves, he doesn't approve anything on his own. Uh, things get approved by the board, things get sent up to him through executive committees and so forth. So it, it's, it's not as easy to say, oh, blank fine cheated you of $500 million and so forth. I, I, I think it's easier said than done, and people, people's natures haven't changed all that much where if a prosecutor thought he or she could become really famous mm -hmm. by going after blank fine, well, I think he probably would. But in many cases, these are Ponzi schemes, and Ponzi schemes, even though they're dressed up as various other investment um, vehicles, they are still Ponzi schemes and they're illegal. Well, they may or may not be Ponzi schemes. The original Ponzi scheme was a fictitious investment. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody has accused Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, or any of the other investment banks, commercial banks, of actually making fictitious investments. Mm -hmm. They've been accused of other things, but mm -hmm. not of Ponzi scheme uh, in the original sense of the word. What you have now are investments that people might have overvalued, and then, well, Who's there to prevent the overvaluation? There are checks and balances there, Stephen. You have the uh, public accounting firms that are independent. You have credit rating agencies. You have in-house counsel. You have outside counsel. You have disclosure counsel. There are a lot of people looking over these things, again, to diffuse responsibility throughout. Does that make it right? I don't know, but it makes it harder to pin an allegation on any single individual. But, but David is making the same point, in a sense, is that how systemic it is. It's so interesting that you talk about public accountancy firm, we know about Anderson, and we know about all these different players, Water, Price Waterhouse, they, you know, the biggest, account, now global accountancy firms, right? Brought in to oversee supposedly global corporations. And of course, they may do some of that, but a lot of the uh, stuff which is on the edge in the gray areas, they're not going to really bite, you know, bite the hand that feeds it. The same with, with the rating agencies, right? We know about this, the, the degree to which the rating agencies were also caught up uh, in saying that these bonds are okay when in fact they were, mm. you know, really on uh, very shaky ground, if, you know, not junk bonds at all. And it was only when the thing burst that the ratings agencies said, oh, well, we, we missed it. How did this happen? You see, this is the same, it's the same thing over and over again. If you're all in the same bed together, Right? And you're all scratching each other's backs, and you're all taking in enormous commissions from one another. You don't really want to pull the plug on each other until the collapse comes, until the bubble, bubble bursts. Right? Now you, you mentioned global corporations, and it's quite clear that we're not the only ones that this happened to. This was a global crisis, although it may have started here in the United States. It certainly spread quickly enough, and we can see evidences, and the book shows evidences of criminality in a lot of other countries, whether it's China or Greece. Um, many other places, but some countries have actually dealt with the, um, the criminality that they found in the market and have had success in them. Iceland, for example. And I wonder, speak a little bit about how this has spread across um, other countries and other financial markets and what they've done about them. Well, the Icelandic case uh, is very important. I'm not a, by any means an expert on this, but they did uh, make uh, the folks in these large corporations who were um, bringing in pensions from all of Europe on this tiny little uh, country around the North Pole somewhere, you know, suddenly had this banking industry from, you know, that was worth probably a billion or so to multi, you know, multi-billion empires, right? In a very short period of time. And people in my country, England, were investing in their pensions. The French were investing in because they were promised this ridiculous rate of return, much as Madoff did, actually, 10% mm -hmm. a year, whatever they were getting, that was absolutely impossible, uh, nay, implausible. But you did it because everybody wants to, you know, get over in a sense, and you, you want to invest as wisely as you can. But when, again, the bubble burst, what happened there was that the, uh, the country came together, the government at the time, and said people have to pay for it, right? This is a, we're a tiny country. We rule basically on a face-to-face -face exposure with one another. We can't hide out in Washington behind, you know, some lobbyist. We can't hide out somewhere else. You have to face each other. And we can't go on as a country, right, as a democracy, unless some people actually pay the price and are seen to pay the price. And they did that. And they didn't go into this multiple year, uh, you know, multi-year long austerity program and had all these people that couldn't afford it pay extraordinarily for other people's, uh, you know, uh, ill-gotten gains. They, everybody kind of paid. 
and they brought the country together and after about two years of adjustment that wasn't kind of the adjustment that the Irish had or the Greeks have and so on and so on, but an adjustment that everybody kind of had to uh, you know, bring in their belt a notch uh, more than before, the, gov the country put itself back on a very firm basis and didn't engage any more in these implausible schemes that we have now. So David, is that a model we could follow? Well, one thing, Iceland is very simple compared to the United States of America. And number two, uh, this country has recovered in a way that many people don't appreciate, perhaps. Now, you can argue against the rightfulness about the Federal Reserve and the Treasury bailing out specific uh, creditors. However, the effect of that has been uh, remarkable stability in many <clears throat> respects. Uh, there hasn't really been a severe austerity here. There hasn't really been a, a, a great deal of, of tax increases across the board. So of course, the, we don't know yet what the outcome of the current negotiations in Washington are going to be. Well, to what extent are you going to measure the, the actions of 2007, 2008 against what? What happens in 2013, sure. 14? At what point do you stop blaming it on President Clinton, if you will? No, I mean, I think that, you know, David's right in the sense that, yeah, that's right. I mean, there, there was a bailing out, which he was opposed, you know, he, he wasn't opposed immediately, or Bush wasn't opposed, but then, then Barack uh, Obama wasn't opposed immediately, but when it was opposed later on with the stimulus, right, acts and so on and so forth. So they bailed, uh, bailed out the uh, General Motors mm -hmm. and the automobile industry. They bailed out the large insurance companies, and he wanted more stimulus to go, and not just simply bailing out, but for people to actually, you know, uh, be able to spend and consume, wow. since about 80% of the economy is based on consumption, it's not mm. a bad idea, right? Mm. And mm. Krugman was saying, you know, this is great. The Republicans were saying, no, enough stimulus, enough for this, enough for that, and so on and so forth. The, the Republicans never said, put the buggers in prison but, that took us there. They just said, no more stimulus so the ordinary person in the street could actually get by. It's kind of interesting. It was interesting how the crisis... Right, was played out and used by the neoliberal politicians to by basically of, mm. uh, you know, frame that the only solution is austerity. Right? So, now, we resisted mm. that here, fortunately, but they didn't resist it in Britain, they didn't resist it in Ireland, they mm. didn't resist it in Greece to the extent that, that those, you know, the, the, the political parties could win out and we could have more of a stimulus or more of a um, pump-priming economy or a Keynesian economy, right? They lost out. And in Europe, what do you see now? Portugal, 22% unemployment. Greece, 26% unemployment. Uh, Ireland, 26% unemployment. You know, my country, negative growth for like five quarters. I mean, what a great success story that's been, right? And, and really nothing really done about the crisis. So in that sense, you know, what we did in the United States was much better than they did in Europe. We just didn't do enough of it in terms of stimulus, and we didn't send the bastards into prison, which we should have done. Well, let's get back into the trenches again. You mentioned prison. I mean, it's, it's a truism that as soon as regulators come up with a new law or a new way of going after a particular deal or device, the, the, the wizards of Wall Street have another way of getting around it or have got a, a, a more sophisticated financial vehicle. You're a forensic accountant. Tell us a little bit about what that means. How do you discover and, more to the point, prevent some of the things that have been going on in Wall Street with an idea that in the future we're going to have, be facing even more sophisticated fraud, uh, examples of fraud and, uh, um, and, and misrepresentation? Well, there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, there's no one sure way. Uh, people have suggested everything from raising capital requirements that, that provides more of a buffer against loss mm -hmm. to having more elaborate disclosures to reinstating Glass-Steagall. Mm -hmm. There are a whole host of things that... What was Glass-Steagall? Glass-Steagall was what you referenced earlier about the law separating investment from commercial banking. That was in effect uh, shortly after the, the Depression. That was uh, uh, overturned and it allowed firms, financial institutions such as Citigroup and others mm -hmm. to become mm -hmm. behemoths mm -hmm. and sell insurance mm -hmm. and, 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 and market investments mm -hmm. and make loans and all kinds of things. So, you know, you know, people have suggested these things about going back and making things simpler, you know, a bucolic existence, if you will. I, I'm not sure that there are solutions in, in a meaningful sense. I, I think people... The smartest people try to fool other people, 
And to the extent that you're not as smart as somebody else, you, it may behoove you to get somebody on your side, mm -hmm. get help. Yeah, but let's get a little bit more specific. I mean, one of the issues at the heart of the crisis in 2008, the meltdown, was the securitization of a lot of mortgages, mm -hmm. which were toxic, which, which were totally valueless. Uh, we've only, I mean, some people certainly knew about that and recognized that and, and, and called attention to it, and nobody listened. Um, so we're not likely to see that happen again, I would imagine. And people are now are primed to look for uh, that sort of development when it happens. But there are any number of possibly sophisticated other schemes that very clever investors may be using that may be completely legal at the moment that we won't catch until it's too late. And what I'm wondering about is whether forensic accounting or, or, a, or a careful look at what the market is doing and what Wall Street is doing can alert us to those problems before they become really toxic. The first place I would focus forensic accounting resources on would be valuations. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the place where you can game the system very well because look at it from a very simple accounting perspective. You have your credits and debits. You've heard of double entry bookkeeping. It's not all that complicated in many respects. So when you flood the market with lots and lots of loans, what you're basically doing is putting a lot of credits out there. That's what the banks do. They give you credit. And so you have to have the debit out there. And so what happens is those debits may or may not be realistic. They may or may not reflect economic reality. Take one of your loans, for example. When you loaned $100 to somebody that really has no job, no income, uh, inadequate property, that loan is not really worth the $100. That loan is worth a heck of a lot less because they're not likely to pay it back. So you look on the valuations of the assets. The asset quality, I think, is where a forensic account should focus, among other places, but that's where I would start first. What about the global level? I mean, you mentioned what other countries are doing. I mean, there's, it's obvious that acting alone, the United States, is not going to totally solve the issue. I mean, this is a global issue. Right now, the Justice, Justice Department has been going after uh, big banks abroad, the Swiss banks, for instance, and uh, banks in Britain for manipulating exchange rates, manip manipulating the LIBOR rate. Right. Uh, um, I mean, are we sort of stuck in a sense that there's some things that we can't do as a country? Or are there ways that we can internationalize the solution? Yeah, well, I, th I think we can do a lot, it, but it takes political will okay. to do it. You know, I mean, again, you know, go back to in history and, you know, look at Roosevelt, you know, when he was facing the economic royalists in the 1930s. And he's, um, he was from their class, right? He was from the ruling mm -hmm. class and uh, he was very well connected. But he had to do something to save the system from itself, right? In fact, to save capitalism from itself, 25, 30 percent unemployment, we can't continue that way. Uh, are we going to face a revolution? I mean, it was that kind of situation. And he was, had to you know, do something to regulate the economy, to say that the markets are not the panacea, to rein in uh, these extremely connected and powerful people. And he did it, right? And the problem with what he did, he didn't go far enough. He actually died before he could put in uh, to place uh, an economic fair deal, right? He put in a social and political fair deal, but he didn't put in an economic fair deal. And we That's did have a, kind of what we, we need now. We did have a global war, which got us well, back. Well, sure, it got us out, of, you know, got the factories back, you know, and so on and so on. I, I know that. And, and also destroyed capital, right? You destroyed capital, so capital had to reinvest in on itself to rebuild itself. I mean, I think what we're facing now is, whilst we didn't have the same austerity as, uh, as Europe, we, we do have, uh, you know, very uh, many millions in um, long-term unemployment that desperately need uh, enough uh, income to spend on their family and to be invested in those communities. We do have that, and nothing's happened to them. And we do have uh, tens of thousands of people who don't have any home, lost their homes under foreclosure, probably living with other families, or living on the street. We do, so there were injuries, right? There was social harm done in this country that was felt by many millions of people. The point is now, I think, is an, an honest accounting of what went on, right? And then a new kind of vista about mm. how we're going to move forward in both the political, or the political economy, the politics and the economy, that are indelibly intertwined in order to, you know, take people forward into uh, a, new, uh, a new future, which we know is globalised, but let it be globalised where it's more accountable. See, I think, I think the danger is that we're saying, look, 
everything's become so complicated and mm -hmm. complex and now no longer local and it's no longer national, it's international. It's kind of a, has a life of its own. It's beyond anybody's control. See, but I don't buy that, you see. I think these problems are human-made problems, right? They're system, systemic problems, but it's a human system. Well, let's look at that. In the, in the few minutes we have left, let's, let's widen our scope a bit and look at the culture that allows this sort of thing to happen. It's exactly. not just yeah, the Wall sure. Street bosses. It's not just the Main Street bankers. Absolutely. It's us who right. fall for these schemes, these get-rich-quick schemes, because we all want to make money, uh, and we'd like to make it easily. I mean, there's a culture in America, for sure, and possibly other countries as well, where, you know, as we showed in our opening clip, where we kind of love the con man, as long as the joke isn't on us. I mean, we, we, we like the charming swindler, especially if we think he's going to make us money and we can get out fast. I mean, there's not much we can do about that. That's part of our sort of cultural or genetic predisposition. Am I right? I mean, well, that, that's certainly at play here. I mean, people always attribute these wrongs to greed. Uh, I'm not so sure it is greed. I think it's also a, a matter of self-esteem and respect among your peers. How so? It, well, if you're an investment manager, you, you cannot make 3% on your investment and remain at your job. Yeah. If you are uh, managing a pension fund, and you are responsible for making sure the, uh, the pensioners get what's owed to them, you cannot be satisfied by an investment that returns you only 2%. So everybody wants to appear to have found the solution. And in some ways, it's like the Ralph Cramden thing where you, know, you go for the, the big score. But in other ways, it's, it's just a lot of pressure, a lot of strain on people to sort of hit the big score, to hit the grand slam when uh, we don't have a singles and doubles culture. But yeah, you, uh, uh, David, in your, in your studies of sociology, I mean, there have been sociologists that have written things like conspicuous consumption, sure. things that have gotten way out of control here that, that may be cultural. But if you had, I just want to interject with respect to what David said earlier about uh, perhaps governments being able to regulate and rein in things. The best corporations do it better than governments because governments tend to be behind the curve, in my opinion. So if you want to regulate Goldman Sachs, the government's not going to be able to regulate Goldman Sachs as well as Goldman Sachs can regulate Goldman Sachs. I mean, that, that to me, I, I, st I strongly stand behind that. Now, whether Goldman Sachs wants to do that is a whole other issue, but they can do it a lot better than the government can. Yeah, I think we'll have to leave it there, but gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. The 2008 financial meltdown still casts a shadow over our economy. Our national leaders are focusing on how to make us solvent again, getting the jobs back, reducing the deficit, cutting spending. But discussion about the criminality and greed that helped get us here in the first place, has mostly faded. Maybe because none of us likes to admit we fell for some very smooth talkers who made promises that were impossible to sustain. Cheap mortgages, sky-high profits. It's a safe bet that the alpha players on Wall Street are already hatching ingenious new schemes. Will we let them get away with it again? I'm Steve Handelman. Thanks for watching. See you next time.